All right, Merry Christmas, everybody. We're entering in to the last week. The, the climax of Christmas is coming, Christmas Day, and it's Sunday the 18th, and we're preparing ourselves as we look at the incarnation, this incredible story of God dwelling in flesh. And so as we get into this today, uh, I have a goal for you. My goal is that through our, our looking at the scriptures today, you would see God in a bigger way. Uh, I want to help make God immense in your mind and hopefully simultaneously decrease your size to realize that when we compare ourselves to God, we are very minor in respect to his grandness. So that's my hope for you today. And we've titled this today, The, the Gift Sent. As we look at this incredible story, uh, one of the things that I find interesting about Christmas, though, is I think Christmas has become one of the most misunderstood stories. When we understand it from the Bible's perspective, when we understand it from God's perspective, um, I think that the story is the most incredible story that we have watered down, we have uh, misused, abused. I think we have confused it. We've diminished it. Uh, our cultures twisted it and marginalized it. And, and it gets lost in the glitz and the glamour and the greed. So that all we see perhaps are gifts and decorations instead of the incredible gift of Jesus who came to us. So my hope today is we're going to realign and recalibrate, recalibrate our minds and our hearts into the truth of Christmas through the incarnation. So we're going to open up to John 1. So if you want to get there, some people would say, wait a minute, why aren't we going to start with, with you know, Mary and Joseph? We always talk Mary and Joseph. I'm actually going to take you back before Mary and Joseph for a few minutes. See, John is going to lay out very clearly something that you and I need to hear today. And we need to understand if we're going to have the right perspective of Christmas, the right perspective of the incarnation, we need to go back further than Mary and Joseph. We need to go way back in time. And so John, writing from the book of John, starts this way. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we have to pause there because this has been a, a, a text of a lot of discussion, a lot of confusion. Cults have been birthed out of misunderstanding this text. And we need to look at it for what it is very carefully. First of all, the word, or in the, the Greek, the logos, this is an important term that John uses. And he uses it because it's going to get the attention of two major audiences of the time. One, we've got the Greeks and the philosophers, the Gentiles. And they would recognize this word as the eternal force that drives everything, this eternal power. And so, I think John very carefully chooses the Logos. And secondly, he's going to now also speak to the Jews of the day. Remember the Jews, they would <clears throat> be reflecting back to Genesis. And they would remember the words of Genesis, the first verse, in the beginning, God created, in the beginning. And I want to make it clear today that John is making a point. He's going to talk about the word and he's ultimately going to unravel that the word is, in fact, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And so as we go into there, let's just look a little deeper at the first thing is, he says, in the beginning. Because some people will grab this and they'll try to use this verbiage to uh, associate with the beginning of God. And that's not what this is talking about. See, God has always existed, which is really hard for you and me. I don't know about you, but we understand birth. We understand death. We understand the cycle of life. And God lives outside of all of that. And so we have to get the picture that he's referring specifically to when all things were created, as the earth took form, as God spoke things into existence. So, so John attaches first this idea that in the beginning, when all things were created, the Word was with God. And then he says also that the Word was God. So the Word was with God and the Word was God. And we have to understand so carefully that we don't just race through this because our English language, as helpful as it can be, is also very limiting. And I want to emphasize with for a moment. See, for you and me, I think we would look at with as a proximity word. I was with my wife when we went to the movie. 
or I, ha- I was with the dog in the boat. And so we, we usually look at it as this proximity where I am in relation to somebody. But the word that, that John would have used here in the Greek would have been much more uh, de- defining. And really the, the heart of it would be that it was a living and active union. So the word was in a living and active union with God. They were, they were in a, an intense relationship with one another. They were intimately known to one another in this incredible picture of one God and yet these unique persons. And we're going to unravel this mystery some more. Secondly, it says that uh, the word was God, and this is the key. And so uh, the first point I kind of skip past, but I want you to catch it is that you might want to write this down, is that the word is God. The word is God. In the text, though, it says the word was God. In other words, look, when you look back in the beginning, there was the word and, and it was God. That was God in action. And it's a really important piece because a lot of people want to get off track. They want to get away from the true and living God. And they want to, uh, some cults will ascribe a totally different, lesser God. And they'll go off track and not want to give the word the status of deity. And yet John makes it clear. No, listen, the word was with God and the word was God. But he continues on as if uh, saying at one time wasn't enough. John says this in verse 2. He was in the beginning. In case you missed it in my first two lines, he was in the beginning before all things. He, the Word, was in the beginning with God. And then let me triple down on my statement. (laughs) All things were made through him. He's going to emphasize this. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Is that clear enough? Not some things, not a few things, not most things. It says all things, and there's nothing else that's made without him. Everything came by the word. Everything. The creation of the world, the plants, Humans, the sun, the moon, the stars, the universe, everything that you see, everything that you understand is a result of God. And for many, that is the stopping point of the Christmas story. Because that means if there is a God, then I might be accountable to him. And so I think that Christmas has often been derailed because what people want to do is say, this is a really cool story. I love this picture of this man and wife and this baby, and it's so cool, and and it makes a great nativity scene, and it looks great projected big on buildings, and even the people dress up this time of year, and I love it. And I love that uh, we get presents, and then we have a great meal, and, and I love all that part. We get the family together, and all those things quickly overshadow what the intent of Christmas was. So I'd like to kind of keep pressing, though. I want to read this to you. I I added some things. Uh, These are just emphases. So I want you to look, if you're at a screen where you can't quite see, because I wanted to put it on one screen. I want you to take a look with me um, at verse 1 again and look at how we could take now the truth that we've understood and insert the name Jesus with me. In the beginning was the Word, Jesus. And the Word, Jesus, was God. And the Word, Jesus, was with God. Sorry, I flipped those two. My apologies. He, Jesus, was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, Jesus. And without Him, Jesus, not anything made was ever made. The emphasis is on who Jesus is. And John is laying this out clearly. And so I want to I want to pause and maybe you need to set your Bible down for a moment because I think one of the things that will happen is we've gone very big intellectually. And the further we go here, sometimes we miss it. We miss the point of the message. And so I'm going to have you do something. If you have your notes there, I encourage you to draw a circle for me. Just draw a circle. And if you want to think about uh, pie charts, pie charts are a way that kind of look like this where we, we can figure out um, the, the quantities of things. So for instance, you might say, um, you know, 80% of my house loves pizza and 20% doesn't. But I want you to do something for me. I want you to think about yourself for a moment. Just that circle represents you. 
And then I want you to create a pie piece and write a percentage of, of how much knowledge you have about the world. Uh, how about uh, include in that your skills, your abilities, your talents, if you can play multiple instruments, if you can speak multiple languages, if you've gone to many colleges, if you have skill trades that are just really impressive with welding or whatever it is, assign to yourself a percentage, a pie piece of how much knowledge, how much wisdom you possess. Just curious, just, just a personal reflection real quick. Would you give yourself a 5%, a 50%? How much would you say you know when it comes to the things of our world? How much do you know? And now I'm gonna challenge your pie piece for a few minutes. See, I told you I wanted to make God bigger, but I think I need to help you get smaller first. Because the smaller I get in my mind in comparison to God, the bigger he becomes. And right now, I feel pretty big. But let's start here. How many uh, words in the English language do you know? Let's just, just for a moment, just think about that. You don't have to answer. How many words do you know in just the English language? How many would you say you know? Do you know how many there are in total by any chance? So just to let you know, there's 171,146 words. 171,146 words. And now my question for you is, do you know every one of those? And can you define them? Can you use them in a, in a sentence? Can you pronounce them and spell them? Is your pie piece shrinking? See, God knows all of them. And he could pronounce them perfectly and use them in a sentence exactly and probably correct some of the definitions that are out there today and go, no, 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 hey, you, you've forgotten something. You got confused here. See, God knows them perfectly, but let's, let's stretch our minds a little bit more. How many languages do you know? How many languages? Of all the languages that are out there, how many do you know? You might know two or three. Or, and then you have to ask the question, do I know them fully? I think for myself, I realized I really don't know the English language fully. But how many languages do you know? And do you realize that there are 7,100 languages? 7,100 languages. That doesn't include what are called dialects of that language. The number's somewhere around 16,000. But, but just 7,100, how many of those languages do you know? How much don't you know? How about all the sign languages? Did you know that there's 3,500 recognized different forms of sign language? How many of those do you know? And I want you to start to realize that of all the known things out there, we think we've got it figured out until we get a bigger perspective and start to look around. I would tell you that God knows all those languages. And he knows all the people that speak those languages. And I'll add that he would know them perfectly. And there'd be no words he would forget and no words he couldn't pronounce. And there'd be no accents that would sound weird if he were to speak those. It would sound exactly the way it's supposed to. And how about how many people do you know? Let's, let's dig in. How many, how many people do you know in the world? Some of you probably go, well, I have like 7,000 Facebook friends. I got a lot of them. Well, there's roughly 8 billion people in the world now. 8 billion. And so here's the question. How many of those do you really know? And how well do you really know them? Do you know their desires and their past their future? Do you know, as God knows, the numbers of hairs on the heads of each individual? You see, God knows every single person intimately and fully and completely. He knows you fully and completely. And then add to the eight billion all those who previously existed that God knows and those who will exist tomorrow. And God knows and he wants to know you. You see, he knows you. 
He knows who you are, but he wants to know you. He wants to be in relationship with you. And, and we're getting the picture of the Christmas story, but I can't stop there. Let's go a little further because I don't think you're small enough yet. So let's take a look at you from space. If you can see yourself, there you are. One little dot, a few hundred feet above looking down. That's Stewart Park in, here in Roseburg. And if you were to walk that little section of the screen that you see a picture of, it'd take you a couple minutes. But you're just a dot. Just a small little thing. You thought you were so big and mighty when you came in and sat down. You're just a small thing compared to this. And God knows you. He knows where you are right now. He knows where you'll be tomorrow. But let's go further out. Let's, let's go further. And, and God, I think, just giggles when we think how wise we are. Take a look at the earth now, and I can't even figure out where you'd be. You wouldn't be recognizable from this distance out. In fact, just to get an idea, if we were on the moon looking at the earth, if you chose to walk from the earth to the moon, it'd take you nine and a half years. 24-7 at three miles an hour, it'd take you nine and a half years. And God goes, yeah, I just spoke that. I just hold that. I just, I make it happen. This is me. I keep these things the right distance apart so the moon doesn't smash you. I hold all those things and, and I know you. And I want relationship with you. See, I spoke those into existence and we go further out in space and there's our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. Oh, there you are again. Not much left. Hard to see. Some 100 billion stars alone in our galaxy, just our little galaxy. If you don't know that number of billion, let me give you a reference. Um, your heartbeat, the average person who lives into their 80s, their heart will have beat three billion times. And there's a hundred billion stars. It's just in our galaxy. And God says this in Psalm 147. He says, I placed those and I named them. How big do you feel? Does, does he feel any bigger in your mind? Because I'm going to have to go further out, but before I do, you got to know, if you wanted to walk just across the Milky Way galaxy, it would take you 18 trillion years. 18 trillion years. If we're blessed of health and make it 100 years, we wouldn't even make it across a tiny portion of this expanse of just one galaxy, our galaxy, that God says, and I just breathe it in. And I just say, go. And I, I speak it, and there it is, the Word created all things. We got to go a little further. I'm almost there because there you are again in that little tiny galaxy amongst the galaxies. Obviously, they don't know how many galaxies are out there. There's lots of estimates. One thing you could do is hold your thumb out at the sky tonight, and you can look and cover up about 100 to 500 galaxies just under your thumb is what they estimate. The expanse is so immense. If you decided you wanted to go for a walk, you could walk from one end, if you could ever find it, to the other, and it would take you an eternity, and you still would never be at the end, and it would just continue. And God says, I just hold all this. This is all my doing. I just, I just speak, and it happens. We're just a sea, one in the sea of galaxies. And yet God knows each one of you and desires to say, look, I want to be your God. I want to know you and me together. I want to be the king of your relationship. He says it this way, look, I, I hold all things together. I created them. I know all. I know everything. I, I've always existed and I always will exist and just get the picture for a moment. Imagine God holding all things, speaking everything into existence, having all power, all knowledge, all that you can ever imagine. Here he is. And then he does something that blows my mind. He does this. He says, I'm going to live in my creation. I'm going to empty myself. I'm going to humble myself and I'm going to dwell in this infant baby that we celebrate at Christmas, the birth of Jesus. The 
controller of all things of the universe says, look, I'll, I'll come here. And, and it's not just, oh, I'll just be a baby. I'm going to be dependent on my creation to care for me. How much humility does that take? I don't know that I could do it. I'm going to be dependent. I'm going to exist for a season as a baby with no kneecaps. That's a weird thing to me, that the kneecaps eventually grow with more taste buds but can't taste salt than an adult. More taste buds than an adult but can't even taste salt. I don't, I don't know how this works. Taste buds change, and, and, I, and I can't feed myself, and I'm not going to be able to clothe myself. I'm not going to be able to wash myself. I'm going to be dependent on my creation. That's what God has done at Christmas. That's the beginning of the incredible story, and, and John says it this way. Verse 14, and the Word became flesh. Just take that in. Don't race into the past. It's just, just breathe that for a moment. And the Word became flesh. The Word that is God is Jesus, and Jesus is the Word, and the Word became flesh, and Jesus came in the flesh. I don't want you to miss that. See, the Old Testament, the one of the prophets, Isaiah, in, in verse 7, 14, said it this way, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call him Emmanuel, God with us. The incarnation. God will take on flesh. And then he says, and he will dwell among us and we have only and we have seen his glory glory of the only son from the father full of grace and truth he will dwell among us this, this would have been a, a, an understanding from the Jews of the day, back to the time of the Israelites when, when they would the God would dwell in the tabernacle that was the place and they would take God with them. And he tabernacled with them. He, he tented with them. And he was their guide through the wilderness. So you could look at it from this way, that, that God camped with his people to lead them, to guide them, to forgive them, and to deliver them. And on and on it goes. And he was with them. But today we have this new incredible understanding that when Jesus came to dwell with us, he says, look, it's not just to be with you, but I'm going to be in you. I'm moving in. I'm going to take up residence. With, if you'll put your faith in me, I will take up residence in you. And where you go, I will go. And I will be your guide. And I will deliver you. And I will forgive your sins. And I will lead you. So today, God is with us. But he is also in us if we have accepted this truth. This incredible gift that was sent to us. And then it goes in and he says this, we have seen his glory. And I just, we have to pause for a moment because this word is so difficult to define. We read it over and over again throughout the text, throughout the scriptures about God's glory. It's tough to define. Let me make an example. If I, if I was going to define for you a yo-yo, some of you can visually picture a yo-yo. Some of you think I'm a yo-yo, and that's fine. But here's what the yo-yo is, right? It's, it's a, a round object, disc-shaped, and usually there's a cut in the middle, and you put a rope or string in it, and you can wind that string, attach to your finger, throw it to the ground, it gets to the end of the string, and because of the, the movement and spinning, it, you can make it come back up the string. That's how I might define a yo-yo. But how would you define grace? How about this? Define beautiful then. That's an easy task. Define beautiful. Well, pleasing to the eye, I guess. Not everything is beautiful to everybody. But it's tough to define. So I don't know that I can do it justice, but it reminds me of this moment we think of glory. Of In Exodus, there's this moment where Moses is on the mountain with God. And, it, and I think there's this, like, I really want to see you. And God's like, yeah, you can't do this. This isn't going to be good for you if you see me. But here's what I'll do. You get in this crevice, and I'm going to put my hand, and I'm going to walk past you. 
And my glory is going to shine on you. In fact, it's interesting that when Moses comes off the mountain, he's still glowing from this presence of God's glory. And it freaks people out. (laughs) I mean, they're scared to be around him. There's something about innate about God's glory that it's not just brightness. There's more to it. So the only way that I've found that I can try to bring it to maybe a little bit of sense is this. When he says we have seen his glory, we have seen God himself, his glory. We have, we have seen the attributes of God, his love, his wrath, his peace, his joy. We've seen it. We've seen his presence. We've seen his resurrection. And we've seen his perfection. He lived a perfect life. We have, we have seen the glory of God as sent from the Father. And I think this is an important piece because John would be writing, also, this is after the resurrection of Christ. So he's got to be referencing this incredible moment when Christ was ascended back into heaven, that his glory was revealed in that as well. He finishes with one last thought. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, glory as only the Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. I spent a lot of time this morning kind of preparing and thinking about this particular statement, this idea of grace and truth. And first, for those, we understand grace is this unmerited favor. We just, we don't deserve this. We don't deserve God's love and forgiveness. We don't deserve his mercy. There's nothing we deserve, and yet he lavishes us with grace. We don't deserve the breath that we're taking right now. We don't deserve to hear his word of truth. We don't deserve it, and yet We get grace. But the second part about the truth was this, that one, God can't lie. He's perfect and holy. So he can only tell truth. That's an important aspect of God, an attribute that he carries. But also, Jesus makes statements along this. He says, look, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. It's truth. The world doesn't like that absolute truth idea that there's only what one way? I don't think so, Jesus. I think I can figure out other ways. And he says, that's not truth. So we hold this truth carefully because Jesus says, look, I bring truth. And yes, I bring forgiveness, but I bring a reality. Without me, you will find no forgiveness. Without me, you will not be freed from sin. See, I came as the gift sent for you that you would find in me something that you can't find anywhere else. One, I came that you would become a child. See, I just, I was wrestling with this and just, it just impressed on me that Jesus became a child so that we could have the right to become children of God. Like Jesus had to pour himself out, empty himself. Remember Philippians 2. He didn't hold on to his godliness. He says, look, I'll do this. I, I'll go live in that infant body and I will have no kneecaps for a while. But then I'm going to prove to you who I am. I'm going to live a perfect life because I'm holy, because I'm of my divinity, because of who I am. And then I will die for you. And I will take the sins of the world on myself. And then I will rise again and defeat death. And I will prove it to you. So one, he says, look, in me, you find forgiveness and the right to be called a children of God, but you must put your faith in me. So this Christmas, don't miss that part of the message. Opening presents on Christmas does not dictate that you are, have faith in Christ. Decorating a tree does not say that you are a follower of Jesus. Opening, uh, having your family over for a meal is good, but it does not declare righteous in Christ. It's faith alone, faith in Christ. So the gift has come. You must receive it. It doesn't happen just because you participate in activities. The other thing he brings is life. In verse 4, I know I've jumped around a little through this passage, but just hang in with me. See, life is found in Jesus, true life. It says, in him was life, and the the life of was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Pastor Jason 
he was just reflecting on this, and I know we're going to talk more on Christmas Eve and through the Christmas weekend, but, but this is the only gift that pursued you. All the other gifts you've got to work for, you got to earn money. Someone has to buy it for you. And Jesus says, I paid for it and it's free. And that gift is life. Christmas is a story about life. The life found in Christ. So I wish you a Merry Christmas as you prepare this week. I encourage you not to forget that the story of Christ is about God who dwelt in the flesh, who came to be with us to came to be for us, and to came to live in us. So I'm going to release to the campuses. Love you guys. Have a Merry Christmas. Well, you stuck around till the very end. I'm so glad you could stay with me. I want to, uh, instead of giving you a kind of a to-do list or a challenge for the week, we often do a transformational moment. I want to first encourage you to continue to pray daily. Just use that blessed rhythm of, of beginning your day in prayer and inviting God every day into your heart, reminding yourself of who he is. But, but here's what I want to leave you with. I think that this week, it would be really important if you spent some time reflecting. So I want to encourage you of several things. One, I encourage you to find rest through the Christmas season. Jesus came that we would have rest. And I, I know that the Christmas season can be exhausting. We're all panicked about who's going to have the right this or that and what family members are coming. I want to encourage you to find rest in Christ. Secondly, to refresh. Refresh your, your picture of God and, and the enormity of who he is and what he was willing to do for us. I encourage you to recalibrate, to, to go back to God's word and go, oh yeah, thank you, God. Thank you for for forgiving me of sin. Thank you for bringing and restoring relationship with me. I want to encourage you to receive, though. As you think about the gift that was sent, I just want to leave you with this. Have you truly received the gift? The, the, the scriptures teach us that all it takes is faith, that we're just to come before God and say, God, I'm a sinner, and I cannot live up to the standard of perfection. And so to receive that, you simply confess your sins and declare that Jesus is Lord and begin a journey of daily pursuing him and in encouraging him and working with him as he wants to transform you to be like him someday. So I love you guys. I hope you have an incredible Christmas as you get ready into the week. Let me just pray over you and uh, wish you a Merry Christmas. So Father God, thank you so much for those who today get to hear your word. Thank you for the truth of Jesus. Thank you for the grace of Jesus. Thank you that you, God, the word became flesh. Thank you, God. Help each of us who are listening today to fully receive, fully accept, and fully surrender our lives to the greatest king that could ever exist. God, thank you for creating us. It's in your name we pray. Amen.